let's talk about the economic backdrop because your roots, right? When you started out, you are an economist and you think about things, the macro environment, the jobs report today, um, some strength, maybe some concerns about things starting to slow down. What does the U.S. economic environment look like to you, the business environment as well, and what it means for some of your investments? Sure. Uh, it uh, it looks like the um, that corporations are losing pricing power, and we are now beginning to see the unemployment rate move up. It, it went up to 3.9 percent in this latest report, uh, from a low of 3.4 percent. So undeniably, it's on its on its way up now. And we do think it's uh, because corporations are losing pricing power, their margins are getting hit. It's going to uh, it's going to cause a couple of things. One, uh, the labor hoarding that we've seen since COVID uh, is going to diminish, and, and that will increase the unemployment rate. But then the second thing is it will accelerate the adoption of technologies. Innovation solves problems, and one of the things that it does is increase productivity, increase efficiency, uh, and create new products and services. So uh, we're, we're pretty optimistic about our strategy in this environment because uh, interest rates should come down. I think um, I think that the Fed, even the Fed, is going to be surprised at how low uh, inflation goes. We think it could be negative this year. Well, so so Kathy, let me ask you that. That's interesting. I mean, if the expectations, at least according to um, traders right now, is that the first rate cut comes in June, is that too late in your view for the Fed to start cutting rates? Well, I think the 24-fold increase in interest rates in little more than a year has shocked the system. Uh, we're beginning to see a reverberation of the regional bank uh, issues. Uh, we don't think they are going away. Deposits are still outflowing broadly from the banking system. And uh, there are increasing problems with commercial real estate. Most people know about the office mm -hmm. uh, problems. But multifamily uh, units, uh, multifamily apartments, uh, we're beginning to see some distressed sales there as well. Uh, so I think that's, uh, uh, that problem isn't as well um, understood, I think, and uh, it's going to cause the regional banks even more problems. Kathy, how quickly do you think unemployment can go up this year? What are you forecasting over at ARC? Well, we, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, the unemployment rate go above 5%. Um, now, I'm saying that knowing that this is an election year and uh, that this administration probably will try and spend more than um, is currently in the budgets uh, through executive order or what have you. Uh, so, but, but above 5% would not surprise us. Uh, all right, so above 5%. Well, that's interesting. All right, so we have a good idea of, of your economic and kind of macro backdrop. Having said that, so here we are sitting at a day where we're seeing a little bit of a pullback in stocks, but year to date, the S&P still up more than 7%. We're looking at a NASDAQ 100 that's also up more than 7%. Um, you look at something like the Sox is up around 20% year to date, picking an individual name like an NVIDIA up more than 80%, and I could go on and on and on. Um, there are many who talk about a bubble, some liken it back to 99 2000. Anything in today's equity trade that says bubble to you? Uh, we do not believe we are in a bubble anything like we were in the late 90s. I was there mm -hmm. and uh, the technologies weren't ready. The costs were too high, too much capital, chased too few opportunities too soon. The seeds for what is happening now were planted during the 20 years that ended in the tech and telecom bubble, and they've been germinating for 25 uh, or 30 years. So we're, we, we believe we're ready for prime time. The one place where we could see a correction, and it's just a correction, we're not calling it the end of this at all, uh, is in the chip space. Whenever I hear the word shortage, and we started hearing about GPU shortages uh, about this time last year, uh, as ChatGPT was uh, capturing the imagination of uh, both businesses and consumers. Uh, so for about a year, we've heard that word, and now we're seeing lead time 
times, we believe, come down for GPUs, uh, for NVIDIA in, in particular, uh, from the eight to 11 month range to the three to four month range. So that is uh, suggesting uh, that there was probably a lot of uh, double and triple ordering uh, as the word shortage was making the rounds, mm -hmm. uh, and that those inventories will have to be digested. But is that also because of an increase in supply in terms of output, or is it because you think demand is going down? Which one is it? Oh, I don't think, no, no, demand is not going down, though there is something we expect that uh, I don't hear discussed very much. And it harkens back to the early days of the internet. Um, there was a moment when the internet was taking off, when Cisco was all the rage, and, uh, and then enterprises started thinking seriously about uh, the need to spend aggressively on this new thing called the internet and the backbone. Uh, and they, they paused as a lot of competition started to make the rounds. And uh, Cisco went down 50% plus as, as enterprises were pausing. Now, why are enterprises likely to pause or at least uh, uh, go through an, through an assessment? They have to integrate all of their data first. Proprietary data is the secret to AI's success. And they have to map out in excruciating detail their workflows internally and with uh, suppliers and, and customers and so forth. Uh, and this is going to take time. Uh, so we think this is this movement is real, it's going to be massive, uh, but we think there's been a, a little bit too much too soon. Well, it's interesting to hear you say that, Kathy, because you and, and at ARC were very early uh, to acknowledge the impact of AI. Yet your flagship ARK Innovation ETF has not held shares of NVIDIA in about a year. Um, you do own some of it in your other ETFs. Do you have any regrets mm -hmm. about not have, having held on to the stock or actually increasing your exposure in the last couple of years after more than 530% gain since 2022, since yeah. the end of 2022? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you're right. Uh, we were very early into NVIDIA 10 years ago when it was $5. Now it's roughly $800. Um, and uh, we wrote it uh, most of the way up. But I'll tell you what we did. And this is as a portfolio manager. It's not one action, but the, uh, the what, what it causes in terms of another action. Last year, uh, we sold uh, in the flagship NVIDIA and put it into Coinbase. Mm -hmm. uh, Coinbase, I believe, is up as le at least as much uh, as NVIDIA. And it is much um, less well understood. Uh, the whole crypto uh, movement, the crypto asset movement, Bitcoin as a new asset class and so forth, is not well understood or, or completely accepted out there. So we prefer to go where others uh, are, are not traveling as much. And, you know, as we were moving out of uh, NVIDIA, we were saying, OK, regulators are trying to crush uh, Coinbase here. And we were buying it on every dip. NVIDIA hap to, happened to be uh, one of the sources. Uh, for for that purchase. So it's not just what we do on the sell side, it is what we do on the buy side that uh, uh, that you have to look at. Um, and yes, we do hold it in the more specialized funds, but we've been taking profits there as well for reasons I just described. Yeah, and to be fair, you're right, Coinbase is up about 620% since the end of 2022, so that compares with about 530% gain in NVIDIA. Is there anything though, Kathy, in the NVIDIA story um, that would make you rethink the name and want to become more aggressive on it? Yeah, if the price came down a lot, uh, we would. You know, the, the rate of return expectations or a split? we have. Would a split do it? Because I know we, we've been... No, kind of, no, 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 no okay. that wouldn't change. That yeah. wouldn't change anything. No, the, the, the no, split adjusted then, then the price. Um, so... You know, if you look at uh, our portfolios, what we're trying to capitalize on with a Palantir, for example, uh, are the next stages of this AI revolution. Mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing in the GPU side of things is 
NVIDIA, all praise to Jensen One. I mean, just unbelievable uh, company, execution, vision, and so forth. And, and it's not over. It's going to last a long time. But there are, there are going to be many other companies benefiting from AI. The productivity lift alone is going to be massive, the most massive productivity lift uh, in history, we believe. And so this AI revolution is going to be broad-based and is going to benefit fit a lot of companies in the on the GPU side of course we have AMD as competition but many people do not understand that there's a lot of other surreptitious competition evolving out there uh, each of the hyperscalers uh, mm -hmm. is evolving its own chip strategy you have a Tesla that uh, has designed its own chip for an AI chip for uh, the specialized more specialized autonomous driving opportunity and I think you're going to see a lot of companies developing more specialized chips. Um, we know that uh, NVIDIA, of course, will segment the market as well. So mm. um, we just think that a, a lot of the assumptions for NVIDIA, you know, that this is NVIDIA's market and it's right. alone, that those are changing. Well, we're speaking with Kathy Wood, if you're just joining us. She's the founder and CEO and chief investment officer of ARK Invest. She joins us from St. Petersburg, Florida. So it's interesting, Kathy, too, that, you know, right, everybody seems to be out there making chips. And it's funny, we had a, a conversation yesterday with Chris Miller, who wrote the book Chip Wars, and we talked about TSMC, that everybody can kind of design what they want, but ultimately, right now, they've got to come back to TSMC as the fabricator to make them. So as you say that, I mean, you guys in one of your funds, I think late last month, was selling shares of TSMC. Um, I am curious about, then you're thinking around TSMC. There's a story today, too, about TSMC winning more than $5 billion in grants for their U.S. chip plant, so money, you know, certainly being devoted to them. Um, why maybe pull back a little bit on TSMC, or what is your case for TSMC in the long run? Well, uh the case for TSMC is yes, it is the manufacturer of these merchant chips. So, um, a very big story there. But this is simply a cyclical call, and okay. and it has to do with that word shortage. And TSMC, for example, Broadcom reported last mm -hmm. night. I listened to that call in the semiconductor solutions part of their business. Uh, they were up only four percent, AI up thirty five percent, but everything else down. Um, so there there are some cyclical phenomenon out there, phenomena out there that we think are are um, not, they're not being integrated into the short term um, expectations for a number of stocks. Hey, including, Kath in include, mm -hmm. yeah. So Kathy, I want to move on to Tesla because you brought it up uh, a moment ago. Um, you've been a long time bull on Tesla. You have been buying shares recently uh, after selling them for most of 2023. The stock down about 30% so far this year. We covered the news this week that shipments from Tesla's Shanghai factory sank to the lowest in over a year in February. The challenges facing the EV industry have been well documented. We talked about those a lot. Um, why do you still like Tesla, considering all of the challenges in the EV space and also what many critics would say are disappointing fundamentals? Uh, so, yes, you're right. We were selling last year as it was uh, in the $300 to $400 range. It's back to $175. Um, and this is what portfolio managers do. We have a five-year investment time horizon uh, for Tesla. And our uh, price expectations uh, from here, I mean, we see roughly – uh, a, a seven to tenfold increase. Um, I know we're in the process of re, uh, revising our model, so I'm um, not at liberty to give you the new number. But would that uh, new number be I, higher or lower than two thousand? Well, we're pushing it out a year, and uh, and therefore it will be higher because the autonomous taxi platform uh, opportunity will be in full force, we think. And th and we believe that Tesla will get the lion's share of that market here in the U.S., if not elsewhere. Uh, autonomous taxi platforms are SaaS models. Uh, Tesla's current gross margin is, well, it's in the teens right now because it's been cutting prices. But we think normalized. The EV margin 
is in the 30% range. SaaS margins are in the 80% range. Most analysts focusing on the stock have nothing in uh, their models or very little for autonomous. Our confidence that autonomous is, um, is going to happen has increased because it has happened. Uh, we see Waymo successful. We see a lot of success uh, and commercial success that is in China. It can be done. Uh, we think Tesla will launch a national service. And Tesla, this is where AI comes in. Tesla has orders of magnitude more data than all of the other auto and tech company companies uh, going after this market combined. And what's important about that is, is that it has corner cases that nobody else has. Rare, rare occurrences in uh, on the roads that, that, uh, that it has recorded and it is prepared for it, but others aren't. Kathy, just don't have I, I just want to jump in. It's it's kind of like a running joke with, with the Tesla community what, because Elon Musk says every year we're going to have yes. uh, this autonomous driving technology. And every year yes. since he started saying it, what, 2017, 2018, it has, it has failed to materialize. Why are you so yes. confident it's going to happen in the near future? Well, because it has happened, as I just said. Uh, and so it's not it's not if, it is when. That's the most important uh, reason. Interestingly, in, in his last com conference call, Tesla's last conference call, Elon said, yeah, I know I've been wrong about it, so I'm not even gonna make a projection. I actually thought that was good and maybe it has a better <laughs> shot now. Uh, and we're looking at some of their hiring and their posting job postings and, and seeing rumblings in different cities that uh, they're starting to, to get ready. Hey, Kathy, something I know I brought up this with you before, but I think back to our, our you and my first interview back in May of 2014, so almost 10 years ago, but you brought up Elon Musk when he wasn't a household name or what his company was doing, and you likened him to Thomas Edison. And I guess what I want to ask you, you know this individual, you talk with him, you followed him obviously for a long time. Do you ever feel, you know, do you feel that way still about him in terms of likening him to someone like Thomas Edison? And, and how do you find clarity and feel comfort in some of the questionable and controversial things that that Elon comments on or that he says? Yes, um, well, we, um, uh, we, we're focused on the technology and we're, and, and as is he, uh, he is the inventor of our age. And this age is a very special age because uh, the five major innovation platforms around which we have centered our research um, are converging and three of them he is helping to converge. This autonomous taxi platform opportunity is the convergence of robotics. Autonomous vehicles are robots. Uh, energy storage, they will be electric. Right. And artificial intelligence, where those are three separate S-curves feeding each other uh, and, and, and should lead to super exponential growth. He has understood this idea that technologies are going to converge with one another and that is the way he's been thinking. His first principles research, just because something's been done one way for a very long time, think autos, doesn't mean it's going to remain but, that way. But, and that's why he's going to win. Do you ever feel, though, that he gets distracted or, is, or, or can be too much? I, yeah. Uh, he is so laser focused on technology, um, and and he in in the case of Tesla, the electric vehicle side, that is on automatic pilot. They are just scaling, and what he is doing is becoming a, you know the manufacturer of factories. Uh, he's trying to figure out how to automate and continue to drive down the cost. There, his focus is on autonomous now, certainly, and uh, of course you can. See on X, he's distracted, but he's really more focused on the innovation. How can I go back to the future where I started, which was mm -hmm. in the payments app space, sold to PayPal? Uh, how can I turn this into not only a payments app, uh, but an everything app. And I think he's hard at work doing that in ways that we don't know yet. We are, of course, talking with Kathy Wood. She's the CEO, CIO, and, of course, founder of ARK Invest, joining us from Florida. Hey, Kathy, you're talking about the future of transportation. Uh, we got to talk about Archer Aviation. Uh, one of the most read stories today is about the company that you've been buying up. Uh, it's a developer of air taxis, Archer Aviation. Your stake uh, around 10% across several of your ETFs. Um, you're the third largest investor 
in the name. We should note shares down roughly 30% so far this year. As our own Sam Potter writes today, you are once again on the other side of a short call made by Grizzly Research. Last time you were in a similar spot regarding a different name, Too Simple, you lost a lot and eventually sold most of your position. So talk to us about why you believe in Archer and does it ever worry yeah. you to go against these short sellers? Um, so uh, our, um, our investment process is centered around research and original research. Um, I'll, I'll start with Too Simple. Uh, we sold Too Simple after the uh, CEO, who was the techni technology visionary, left. And um, so Grizzly got that right, I don't think for the right reasons, although we were in the teeth of a massive bear market as well. If that CEO had not left, I don't think we would have sold that stock. In the case of Archer, we have a high degree of confidence in Archer. One thing to understand about ARC is we are the closest, ARC is the closest you'll find to a venture capital company in the public equity markets. Um, and we tread where others in the traditional asset management world will not go, at least on the public side, um, when we see a real opportunity. As we were doing our work on uh, autonomous vehicles, we concluded that the cost is going to drop so much that roads are going to become very congested in the future, much more congested, if you can imagine, New York City. Um, and so we then started doing work about uh, uh, transportation in the skies. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. The FAA is the gating factor from a regulatory point of view. There are two companies uh, the FAA is working very closely with. And, and I think because of successes elsewhere in the world, uh, other companies are having success uh, when, where regulators have not been as strict. I think there's been a little more pressure on the FAA uh, to pay close attention here. And the two are Archer and, and Joby. Mm -hmm. Our confidence went up when Boeing, which was suing it for patent infringement, um, settled the case and actually took an ownership position in Archer, as, uh, as has Stellantis and United Airlines. So three very deep-pocketed uh, partners who are also trying to figure out the future of transportation. Uh, and, and we know um, that uh, they're on their way, both Joby and Archer, to FAA certification. Seems like the process is in motion and uh, we haven't had a hiccup. <laughs> And, and it has an MOU with Abu Dhabi to launch an air taxi service in 26. And it, pending regulation, it has an MOU with Interglobe to launch an air taxi service in India. Both of those but, have been much better from a regulatory point of view. But how big of a concern is it to you that regulators here in the US could drag their feet? We did speak with an airline executive recently uh, who is concerned that the FAA is moving slower uh, than other regulatory bodies when it comes to this type of technology. Yes, and that is why we pay a lot of attention to regulatory arbitrage. We've seen innovation move abroad to other co countries, even Amazon. Uh, you know, the FAA wouldn't let Amazon fly its drones ninth generation uh, nearly 10 years ago on its own property outside. So it went to India and elsewhere. I think the pressure's on the FAA now. Uh, and I, I also think that the bear market of 21 and 22 Two, eliminated a lot of other competition that was brewing. Just the funding markets were closed. Uh, and so I think this market is, um, is uh, much more, um, is uh, that both Joby and Archer are going to have much more share than otherwise would have been the case. So we're pretty excited uh, about the possibilities here. Hey, Kathy, as you said, you know, one of the things about ARC, it's certainly in its DNA, is that you go places and take positions that other people maybe don't do. Um, and one of the things, though, that increasingly I feel like the financial establishment, again, is interested very much so is in crypto. And I want to talk about your spot Bitcoin ETF, if I may, the ARC 21 shares sure. Bitcoin ETF. What can you tell us about institutional in uh, interest in it? Is there or is it mostly uh, the funds that are going into it are mostly from the retail side? Um, well, we are we know there's institutional interest because um, 
we're talking to a lot of institutions, including state treasurers and uh, and public pension funds. And why why is this? Because. Uh, they're trying to figure out if this truly is a new asset class. And if it is, they must have a point of view. As a fiduciary, uh, uh, if if there's a new asset class, which is uncorrelated or shows very low correlation in terms of returns relative to other asset classes, then what, uh, what uh, 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 an asset allocator does is it will take a position to increase returns per unit of risk. That's what happens with low correlation of returns. So definitely, now, are they moving whole hog? Not yet. Mm-hmm. And Nor are the big uh, wirehouses like the Morgan Stanleys and UBSs. Wells Fargo, Merrill Lynch, uh, B of A, um, they are all waiting to see who are the winners in terms of the ETFs because they do not want to commit to an ETF that will close down. Uh, and uh, and makes sense. And, Right. So, and they they they're going to give it what from what we're hearing three to six to nine months. So everything, the net inflows that we've seen, and um, uh, are. Uh, away from those two spaces, really. it's uh, Part of it is our client base switching mm-hmm. from GPTC right. into and other client bases into the ETFs, which are much lower fee. All right, but I do want to also then go to the next level, and that is um, an Ether ETF um, being approved, maybe in May. Uh, are you optimistic that it's going to happen by that May deadline, or what obstacles might be still out there that it won't make that deadline? Yeah, so the the biggest obstacle is staking, and I don't think the regulators will allow staking in this first round, if they allow the first round at all. Now, um, we and one other firm are, are, are will see our final deadline in May if they reject if they reject uh, our filings. Then we'll have to refile. But my guess is um, my guess is they will move more now to a first come first serve mm-hmm. when this next round goes through. So if it's May, it will be without staking. If it's later, there's a better chance for staking. If we if it's in uh, I would say 2025 because I think legislators uh, and legislation is uh, starting to get involved here and taking it away from simply the regulators. Hey, Kathy, I don't want to leave without asking you. It is International Women's Day, and I think about your path. Um, we, Tim and I have been talking a lot to um, many women who have made their way in male-dominated fields, and I'm just curious um, how you think about your trajectory from where you started and what you've achieved. You started two firms or have co-founded one and, and started your own f- firm. Um, how you think about that path and what is top, top of mind in terms of um, those other individuals and other women that that are out there that are maybe trying to do the same. Yes, well, I think the most important thing um, in early years is to make your own bosses look brilliant uh, because <laughs> younger people, younger people coming into the business know so much more about technology and where the world is going almost innately than, shall I say, more seasoned investors. So just make your bosses look brilliant and uh, educate them and, you know, uh, generate enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm, excitement, energy around uh, around ideas uh, and, and make sure you have good mentors. If they're not giving you a good shot after you've made them look brilliant, you know, time to move on. So that's one thing. Uh, As far as starting um, a business, I would say um, make sure there's an unmet need. In our Mm. case, in the case of ARC, um, what we saw was the traditional world going more passive or benchmark sensitive. Uh, when we saw an explosion of innovation, thanks to the five major innovation platforms around which we have centered our research and investing. And so I said to myself, you know, someone has to do this. And um, uh, so we went off. And honestly, I think most people thought we would fail for a couple of reasons. One, we put a truly active, fully transparent equity portfolio inside an ETF wrapper. 
And that had not been done at scale at all. And uh, no one, no one, mm -hmm. it was a passive world that we had entered. And then the second was we're benchmark agnostic. Um, you can put us against any benchmark, and you're going to have to give us some time after the massive interest rate shock that we went through. And now we're on the other side and, and you know, performing better as a result over the last year. Um, yeah. But over time, these, these innovations are going to transform the world and create massive wealth uh, uh, with AI as back to back to that right. topic as the main catalyst. So we couldn't be more optimistic about innovation. All right. Going to leave it there. Kathy, as always, so appreciate all the time that you do give us. Have a great weekend. Kathy Wood, of course, the founder, CEO and CIO of ARK Invest joining us from Florida. Kathy, thank you.